I think Lee is going to enjoy this week's artist, Robert Rauschenberg. Now, he was actually a punk artist from the 50s. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, after the art talk, we have a great session with Neil Cassina, uh, who's been with us uh, for several years now. And after a very successful career at Lockheed Martin and at Raytheon. Yeah, indeed. Now, more about Neil after the art talk on one of my favorite artists. AJ, you know, all of these are your favorite artists. That's why we do them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right. Hello, Sarah. Uh, and over to you. Hi, good morning. So, yes, today for Art Talk 131, we are revisiting an artist that we uh, talked about almost exactly a year ago. It was uh, late January of 2021, actually, that we first looked at uh, Milton Ernest Robert Rauschenberg, known by Robert or even sometimes as Bob. Uh, he was an American painter, sculptor, collage artist, graphic artist, and his art really transcends labels and mediums. He was born in Port Arthur, Texas, and went on to attend the University of Texas at Austin, studying pharmacology, not realizing yet that he was dyslexic. He later dropped out and was drafted into the Navy. After the Navy, he went on to study art at the Kansas City Art Institute, Academy Julien in Paris, and Black Mountain College in North Carolina. He subsequently moved to New York and was part of the Art Students League starting in 1949. Rauschenberg uh, is loosely known as a neo-dataist, which explores the interaction between art objects and real life objects. But really Rauschenberg is part of every post-war art movement since abstract expressionism. Rauschenberg famously stated that painting relates to both art and life and he wanted to work in the gap between the two. So let's see how he blends mediums and topics. Retroactive One belongs to a series of silkscreen paintings that Rauschenberg made between 1962 and 1964. His subject matter and commercial means of production for these works led critics to identify him as a pop, art, as a pop artist. He used mechanically produced screens that allowed him to transcribe his own photographs and images taken from the popular press onto a larger scale. As we can see, uh, these silkscreen pieces revolved around current events at the time, including President JFK and space travel. The data movement consisted of artists who rejected the logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern capitalist society instead expressing nonsense and irrationality and lasted up until the mid 1920s. Rauschenberg was considered to be a neo-dataist uh, along with, hit, with contemporary artist Jasper Johns. So neo-data was a movement with audio, visual and literary manifestations that had similarities in method or intent with earlier data artwork. It sought to close the gap between art and daily life and it was a combination of playfulness, appropriation, and that kind of same nonsensical nature. In 1974, Newsweek did a series called World of Culture and wrote about Rauschenberg and this particular piece. They said, quote, the nihilism of data resurfaced in the works of neo dadaists such as Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, Yves Klien. In such works as his untitled painting above, Rauschenberg sought to remove all personal sensibility from his art. In 1949, Susan Wheel, his partner, introduced him to the method of exposing blueprint paper at her family home in Connecticut. So Wheel and Rauschenberg worked together on a series of blueprint works or cyanotypes through 1951, exposing the paper to light and using objects and human subjects to make the impression. Of course, uh, this one is a cyanotype of her body. And the works were featured in a 1951 article in Life magazine. Miniature versions would also be used by Rauschenberg in some of his collages or combines, as he called them. So each of the five works in Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings in 1951 consists of a different number of modular panels. There are one, two, three, four, and seven panel iterations. Obviously, this is the one panel iteration here that have been painted completely white. In each case, Rauschenberg's primary aim was to create a painting that looked untouched by human hands, as though it had simply arrived in the world 
fully formed and absolutely pure. So this was considered very shocking and even characterized as a cheap swindle when they were first exhibited publicly in 1953. But the white paintings have gradually secured a place in history as important precursors of minimalism and conceptualism. Among the most radical aspects of the series is that these works were conceived as remarkable. Rauschenberg uh, viewed them primarily as a concept. And so he allowed for the physical works to be repainted and refabricated from scratch without his direct involvement. So it was more the idea of what the white paintings represent. This piece was created early in his career before he really developed a name for himself or a signature style. This piece is part of what's known as Fetici Personali, a series of hanging assemblages of animal fur, rope, wood, and various small objects, uh, which Rauschenberg made during his travels with artist Sai Twombly to Italy and North Africa in 1952 and 53. Uh, these were Rauschenberg's first works to involve suspension, and none of which are known to still be in existence, hence why the uh, photo of the sculpture looks more dated to the time that this piece was made. So this is one of Rauschenberg's most famous works. Monogram pushed the art world's buttons by further merging painting and sculpture as the combined moved from the wall to the pedestal. While he began with traditional materials and abstract painting of oil on canvas, he abandoned tradition by adding an array of found objects on top of the canvas to create this three-dimensional combined painting. Uh, Rauschenberg found and purchased a stuffed Angora goat from an office supply store, and later encircled it with a tire he found from uh, the street trash. So Monogram is a work that really engages the viewer on multiple levels and from every angle that you look at it. Rauschenberg described Rebus as, quote, a record of the immediate environment and time. It's a collection of words and images, and it kind of constitutes as this puzzle in a way. Uh, the materials found in the neighborhood around his studio include comic strips, fabric remnants, a museum poster, and a drawing by his friend and artist Cy Twombly. Uh, the work functions as both portrait and landscape, recording the artist's creative impulses at the moment of its making, while also using materials drawn from mass media. This piece is part of a private collection. And again, we can see the blurring and combination of painting, sculpture, and collage. Phoenix scale is made up of solvent transfer, fabric collage, and mirrored panels on wood support with collaged and painted tire, electric lights, and casters. So the skate room is a B Corp that was started in 2014 that brings together art, skating, and social entrepreneurship. Uh, these are three of the six Rauschenberg skateboards that were made in conjunction with the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation that pays tribute to his legacy. Uh, you could see that there were 300 uh, skateboards of each piece made of these limited edition boards, all of which have since sold out. And the skate room has also highlighted artists like last week's Basquiat, Keith Haring, Jeff Koons, Van Gogh, and others. So Rauschenberg believed that art was really a catalyst for social change. In the early 1970s, he actually lobbied the US Congress to pass a bill that would compensate artists when their work is resold on the secondary market. His efforts paid off in 1976 when California Governor Jerry Brown signed the bill into law for the state of California. Rauschenberg received numerous awards during his nearly 60 year artistic career. Among the most prominent were the International Grand Prize in Painting at the 32nd Venice, Venice Biennale in 1964 and the National Medal of Arts in 1993. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I really am curious which office supply store you can buy stuff go to. <laughs> yeah, right? No kidding. Exactly. <laughs> And as you can see, we have our very own found objects. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they're very delicious found objects also, by the way. Now, I actually saw my first Rauschenberg at the L.A. Museum of Contemporary Art in about 79. It's in downtown L.A. At that time, it was actually the temporary contemporary. Hmm. It was in a very gritty part of downtown L.A. And once you entered the building, which was really a warehouse, it was chaos until you kind of just turned this corner. 
There it was. It was just a three by three painting in the center of a very large white wall. It was, it was actually stunning. <laughs> That's, that, that is interesting. I would have loved to have seen yeah. that. So I know Rauschenberg has several uh, pictures at the Broad. Uh, mm -hmm. Sarah, have you seen any of his work? Not that I haven't been to the Broad in a while, so I, I can't say that I've seen any of them, but I should I should get over there soon. Yeah, they're, they're interesting, very interesting pieces. Uh, so Sarah, thank you. Uh, and, and that one piece titled Sue is like the craft that my granddaughter and I created yeah. with leaves and found objects. She loves doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Christie's Auction House, watch out, here we come. <laughs> <laughs>